Hey, that this thing is talking to me, so it's going to go over here. It seems to me that one of the things we need to do today, of all days, is to ask how the original Pentecost still speaks to us, if it still does. What does the report of this day, a day so very, very long ago, tell us about our own lives together as God's people? To do that, I think we have to unpack that old story quite a bit. And I think we have to start back with those, the scripture says 120 people waiting inside that house in Jerusalem, waiting for what Jesus had called the coming of the Spirit. They had been in that house for weeks at that point. Jesus had told them to wait in Jerusalem. And we should imagine that that waiting was painful. They were, after all, a group of people still caught up in a great deal of grief. Jesus had been executed only seven weeks before, and although they had seen him, although they had experienced him as somehow miraculously risen from the dead, he was now officially physically gone from them. Whatever happened next, they would have to do it on their own. Well, not really on their own, because Jesus had promised that the Spirit would come upon them, and so they waited. They waited in that house with their grief and their uncertainty. I imagine that they wondered what exactly they were waiting for. Would they know it when it happened even? I wonder if they felt impatient for that moment. Or were they actually hoping for a bit more time to think it all over? Was it joyful anticipation they felt? Or was it dread at what would be asked of them? There was a lot of anxiety, I think. All those crazy feelings at one time. And then as we heard just now, it happened. The sound like the rushing of a violent wind, the little mark above each head that resembled a tongue of fire. And you know what's next. Those 120 souls, men and women, come marching out of that house where they had gathered led by the same 11 apostles who had, in one way or another, turned their back on Jesus on the night he was betrayed. And yet there they were, at the very front of the procession, is Peter, Simon, who is a lost boy no more. And the disciples led this, I don't know, motley group into streets that were already teeming with Jewish visitors from across the known world. It was Shavuot, the festival of weeks. Shavuot was one of the great, three great festivals in the Jewish calendar. It also commemorated the giving of the law on Mount Sinai, which, as it happens, occurred 50 days after the Israelites had fled Egypt. And so Jews from across the great Jewish diaspora, from Egypt to Rome, to Antioch, to Syria, to Babylon, all these people would come to Jerusalem for a homecoming. And there they would do their temple, retru temple rituals and reunite with family, the families who had migrated to Jerusalem or perhaps had never left it. And then, as you know, the whole thing gets rather weird. Come on, I'm saying, if you're standing on the street and there's the sound of a violent rushing wind, and these people come pouring out of this house like it's a clown car. Excuse me, that may be heretical. <laughs> and then these same followers began to talk about Jesus to anyone on the street who would listen. And as it turns out, the listening was easy because nobody has to say to their neighbor, what did he just say? What did he just say? Because those followers were speaking in the languages of their listeners all the many, many languages. And so when we place ourselves among those festival observers and try to see this from their point of view, did they hear that violent wind? I don't see how they could have avoided it. Something got their attention. And we already talked about the clown car. <laughs> 
And we know that, that what they heard what those followers were saying. And this is where the text said the crowds in the street were astonished and perplexed. You think so? And saying to each other, what does this mean? Indeed, what does this all mean? I don't know about you, but sometimes I find it honestly easier to identify with the folks in the street than to identify with the Jesus followers on that day. I mean, we know what was going on here. We have that benefit. We can see it was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But still, you know, I find myself sometimes standing back a bit from this scene because the truth is I find this outpouring of the Spirit rather intimidating. There's such a bigness to it. Maybe you find it intimidating too. And then you add to that Peter's long quotation from the prophet Joel. Oh my, it's an utterly stirring passage, but it is daunting. Peter is saying that God declares that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. The prediction of the Lord's great coming day, that great and glorious day when God's way will become the world's way, that prediction surely moves it. And it certainly did move that crowd. It's just that this all-encompassing presence of the spirit seems, again I say, so big and so mystical that I think it can make us feel like maybe the Holy Spirit has gotten kind of smaller over the years, or at least become a much smaller presence in our lives. Let's face it, we are 21st century Americans, members of a mainline Protestant denomination, heirs of the Enlightenment. We acknowledge we acknowledge Pentecost, but we are not charismatic. And though I know for a fact that some of you have had, in fact, a mystical experience, and that some of us long to have one, we don't typically speak in tongues or think of ourselves as prophesying. The report we have of the first Pentecost can seem like it belongs to a different ancient age, or at least to people with a much different religious faith than our own. And that is why I thought it important to make Judy suffer through that long, reading that long passage. I thought it was important that we hear the part of this story that is usually left out on Pentecost. Okay, it's always left out on Pentecost. The last 10 versions, verses of this chapter what happened after the witness of the 120? What happened after Peter's sermon? The scripture informs us that Peter ended by calling on the crowd to turn to the risen Christ as Lord and Messiah and be baptized. And according to the report here, around 3,000 more souls were added to the 120. And then what? Something much more down to earth. These people, many of them strangers, made themselves into a community. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They spent much time together in the temple. They broke bread together in their various houses, and they prayed together. And as they were able, they sold their possessions and held all things in common and gave it to any as had any has needed. I know. This last little, little bit is probably why this part of Acts 2 is not read very often. Certainly not in America. It's certainly a bit of scripture. I'm not suggesting you do anything, Henri, but think about it. It's a bit of scripture that can be easily used to irritate the most conservative member of your family at Thanksgiving. You know, you just, you just drop the sentence, you know, the early Christians were communists. 
Judging my, from my trip on the Google machine this week, Christian commentators are still getting the hives about this. But no, I personally think that's a silly discussion. There was no such thing as communist, communism in ancient times. There was no such thing as capitalism. In ancient Palestine, there was only this, the domination system of Rome and its Jewish collaborators, that is the high priest and all his minions. There was violence, but the primary daily form of violence was an economic one with tax, with tax race, taxation rates so high and collection methods so monstrous that for most people, grinding poverty was the only reality. Roughly 90% of this population lived in poverty. Many of those were completely destitute. So no, there's no implied political leanings in this text. The only, it seems to me, the truly important part of these verses is the word together. They studied together. They learned from each other. They prayed together. They ate together. They shared what they had with each other. They took care of each other. They tended the sick, provided for widows and orphans. They faced the world united together. And they did this without any church institutions to guide them and with precious few resources of their own. They simply followed together as best they could the example of Jesus. So let's ask a fundamentally silly question here. Where is the Holy Spirit in all this? Wouldn't we say that the Holy Spirit was present in everything these believers did? The, the Holy Spirit need not enter our lives in a violent rushing of wind or a sudden ability to speak in tongues or in a profound mystical vision. The Holy Spirit is present whenever a group commits itself to living day by day, moment by moment in the way of Jesus. And she is present, that Holy Spirit, in every mundane part of our lives. So can't we say that we still dream dreams, still have visions of what is possible, still, still, still prophesy? Can't we see the Holy Spirit in all those ordinary moments of our lives together as a church community? When our children and youth run out of the church to see if the blessing box needs filling, can't we also see the Holy Spirit at work? When those kids want to help with Gretchen's quilt, isn't that the Holy Spirit? When someone in adult Sunday school makes a comment that gets all of us thinking and talking, isn't that prophesying? When our volunteers patiently fill lunch sacks for second helping and our volunteer cooks show up every Sunday night, every Sunday night, aren't they acting on a vision of what is needed in this world? When someone in the Tuesday book club is facing a difficult time and the other members rally around them in support, isn't that the Holy Spirit working in our lives? Didn't our youth on Confirmation Sunday prophesy from the lectern and from this very pulpit? And when we invite Muslims or Jews to come and speak to us in this sanctuary, aren't we dreaming a really big dream? the dream of all people united by a common desire to know God. Can't we hear the Holy Spirit still speaking to us? You know, there is a personal story that's going to seem odd at first. I couldn't get it out of my head this week. Some years ago, one of my daughters was in London and by herself on Christmas Eve, which did not please me, and she decided to go to the midnight Christmas Eve service at Westminster Abbey, that ancient cathedral. And afterwards, as she was walking home at one o'clock in the morning, she called me to tell me about the service. 
Thousands were packed in the abbey. Everyone was standing shoulder to shoulder. And she told me that her favorite part was when toward the end of the service, they all said the Lord's Prayer together. All those voices humming together as one, the sound rising towards that high, magnificent ceiling. As she talked, that moment was so vivid that I felt like I was there. But there was one more thing. As she prayed, she realized that all these voices speaking in the same cadence were nonetheless speaking in different languages. She heard French and German, some Slavic language, Chinese, maybe others. And that's the part that reminded me this week of Pentecost. All those voices speaking different languages, yet somehow speaking together the same language, the language of the Holy Spirit. My friends, we can speak that language too. That's what Pentecost invites us to do. Amen.